Okay, so I'm going to get started because this is going to be a recorded class. And the way that this is going to work is I'm going to discuss some specific examples and look at them using the welfare inputs and outputs that were discussed in the lesson. And so this is just going to be example assessments for these animals. And they're going to be very basic assessments. So it kind of depends on the institution or personal preference in terms of like what type of welfare assessment you want to use. Pardon me. And so sometimes you have more comprehensive assessments, um, which is something that we used starting out pretty much like right away to kind of set a detailed base. And um, depending on the institution, you can use comprehensive for the general ones. And so that was kind of a long-winded way to say it's up to you. Uh, the examples that I'm going to be using are, um, there's only four. I used four of the most common species of monitors that you see in a captive environment, um, as well as kind of represent some diversity in how these animals spend their time. And so one commonly kept varanid are Komodos. And I wanted to create kind of particular <laughs> situations. Yes, the cat will be here. Um, and give examples of how you would set up welfare assessments and the information that you would need. And so part of the welfare inputs that is important to base some of your housing decisions based off of is uh, the natural history of the species. And this is very basic. So this would just be an example of Komodo dragons as a species, some information on them um, and some individuals and in sub subgenera, um, there's not a lot of wild information on some species. And so you use the information of closer related species that have wild observations and things like that. But we've talked a lot about using species natural history for housing um, and diet and things like that. The more specific information that you would get into for the animal you're assessing is its individual history. So this animal, um, if it's wild caught or captive bred or born, that can have a big influence on behavior and temperament and demeanor towards staff. And in other species, you would use things like where the animals have been housed previously, if they were housed somewhere else. In this specific example, pardon me, um, this animal has been at this institution. So this was a Komodo, for example, that was raised from a hatchling in a zoo setting. And at this point, when you're starting this assessment, the animal is uh, 10 years old. It's been in its enclosure for a number of years. And this is not a situation that would be assessed um, to determine like an incoming animal's um, health and welfare, which I will use another example for that type of situation. Um, how it was housed, which if it's still there, it's basically looking at the enclosure. Previous medical conditions or injuries for this individual would be nose rub as a juvenile, which happens. The diet, which is pretty complex and information on uh, training and enrichment. And so this is just banking the inputs, what you know about the animal. This becomes important when bringing in new animals um, and having information on previous housing and interaction with uh, keepers and things like that. Oh, forlorn meow in the background. And then this is what keepers know the best. And so most of my animal welfare team is composed of keepers. Almost all of them volunteered to be on it. And we also have our uh, guest services manager, our grounds maintenance foreman, our zoo director, and our ed person, um, our education facilitator that uh, are on the welfare team. And this is both for the staff to get more acquainted with animal welfare, seeing, uh, being able to identify good and poor welfare in animals because they're going to be doing a lot of representation and, and um, question answering from the public. And some of these animals are trickier to assess than others. 
And so this is where I would have keepers fill out all the information. We go out and look at the enclosure, which I have an example enclosure that we'll look at in a minute. And this would be all of the information you would collect on what you are currently doing. So what the animal currently has access to, um, what it's surrounded by, what it's eating, um, and any sort of behavioral enrichment or training that it's a part of. And then the fourth major category for welfare inputs is the animal's health. And this is typically where you would include any information on physical exams, the weights, any changes in weights, current weights, and then body condition scoring, which um, a lot of times you have done by a vet, depending on the uh, species that you're assessing. But sometimes you have vets that aren't as familiar with um, reptile body condition and physiology. And in those situations, it's usually, at least in the case of our zoo, it would be myself and the vet that would assess body condition. And then information on any chronic or previous uh, medical conditions, which you don't usually see in varanids, but that would be included there. This is an example enclosure for a Komodo dragon exhibit. So indoor exhibit, which is extensive. I mentioned in previous lessons and it's just kind of, it's noticeable uh, that Komodos do get quite a bit of space. They tend to be um, pretty charismatic in terms of lizards. And so they tend to get larger, more extravagant enclosures than other reptiles. So this has indoor and outdoor space, lots of natural substrate, lots of live plants, um, pretty expansive. And let's say this is the animal. This is an example animal. And this is where body condition gets interesting if that is anything that um, the place that you're at it really worries about is that this is probably a pretty full uh, sub-adult. So our male who was about 10 years old at Fort Worth, he was generally pretty slim, but obviously the amount of food that they can consume causes uh, <laughs> them to be really swollen, <laughs> to be full, and that changes the appearance of the animal. And so body condition, if you did it on a day after like a carcass feed, um, you might get a different score than uh, on an animal um, that hadn't eaten recently that was relatively lean. So the outputs, the things that you're going to be looking at um, in relation to what you're contributing to their life, um, their use of the exhibit space, so how mobile they are, um, both in terms of like foraging behavior and just general alertness, but also if they're interacting with their enclosure, um, if they're soaking, if they're moving and manipulating substrate, and um, thermoregulation, which is a big indicator of the animal's overall health, is that you're seeing it go between basking um, and any of the other back activities and being able to regulate their temperature um, at the desired levels for the desired length of time. If you see lots of constant basking, a lot of times in reptiles, that's an indication that uh, the enclosure itself might not be warm enough and that their preferred temperature is the basking temperature. Um, and that can be an indicator of those temperature needs, but you can also have animals that never bask, that are always active, that never seem to rest. And sometimes that means the ambient combined with that basking spot makes the temperatures too high um, and the animal is too warm to bask. Um, but in this example, the animal has normal activity budget. It has a healthy appearance. There's currently no medical conditions. It has a good appetite, has good digestion. Its poop is normal in frequency and consistency. In varanids, that usually means a mess. Um, even in healthy animals, they tend to poop as hard as they can, which is uh, always exciting when you have them out for an encounter. Um, other species, not Komodos, but other species. So the other uh, area of outputs is behavior and interaction. So this animal would uh, exhibit a normal variety of natural behaviors. It's calm and at ease in its enclosure. It engages with novel items and enrichment, and it has appropriate relationships. So a lot of times captive raised Komodos are pretty gentle. The males um, in particular tend to be pretty passive 
And if they're comfortable in an enclosure, they'll allow you into their space. There's enough space if you do free contact. Um, you usually don't see a lot of aggression unless food is involved. They tend to be pretty passive in general. So an average, almost adult male Komodo um, would have pretty positive, uh, neutral positive interactions with staff. So the assessment, this is the, the five major categories that are in uh, just a general animal welfare assessment. And in our cons comprehensive assessment, there are uh, subcategories in each of these um, sections that you would score and have multiple numerical scores. If you do a, a general assessment, which is just a quick one, one that you would do an annually when there's nothing going on, um, everything this animal is experiencing appears to be the best that it can be. So there's good uh, appetite and healthy digestion with a complex diet, um, with enough food that the animal is satiated but not overfed. The environment meets the animal's needs. It has a lot of space, indoor, outdoor space, natural substrates, a uh, place to retreat from the public, um, maybe not entirely visually, but at least um, floor space wise. The health of the animal is good, no health issues. The natural uh, variety of behaviors is um, where it should be for the animal. It's active when it should be active. Um, when it gets a heavy meal, it spends more time resting. The mental state is something that is difficult to assess um, kind of like uh, objectively about this type of animal. Um, we don't know everything about their brain functioning, but typically if the animal has all of its needs met with enough space to express natural behavior, you can assume unless there's issues like um, nose rub, um, I can't even think of very many abnormal behaviors that you see in varanids besides just extreme destruction if they're in a small enclosure, but that's just because that's what they do. Um, but for this example, it would be safe to assume that the animal is in a good mental state. And that's always going to be kind of based on what you can see. Um, and a lot of times our keepers have the best idea as they've seen animals in a in a higher a high and low mental state in some cases, and so their assessment is important there. So this is not something that we would really address anything on. Um, if there were little changes that staff wanted to make, like frequency and feeding, uh, smaller food items, adding carcass feeds, for example, that can all be brought up at welfare assessments. Um, but in terms of enclosure, there's really it's, it's the best that it can be. So in this example, this would be an almost adult monitor and a very good setup with good care. And so I wanted to then move on to a pretty typical example when it comes to this specific setup. So tree monitors are more commonly captive bred now than they ever have been, but you still get a lot of imports. So a lot of the more Rare arboreal species usually are not captive bred, but it depends. Now in zoos, that's changed quite a bit. So again, we collect our information on the natural history of the species. So compared to Komodos, these are going to be almost entirely arboreal, relatively small, relatively social um, if they're given enough space, and uh, mostly are uh, invertebrate eaters. Pardon me. And so they feel... Uh, they're, they're at a different spot in the food chain compared to Komodo. So Komodos don't have a whole lot of fear of a whole lot of other beings. They're kind of apex predators, obviously, where they're from, and um, adult Komodos can be dangerous to people. So there is always kind of an air about them. Um, they are skittish when they're young, but they tend to become competent as they get older. Green tree monitors and other monitor tree monitor species are going to be a lot more reclusive. They're going to prefer having height uh, over the person that they're interacting with um, in the wild, their retreat would be uh, vertically. So they would uh, retreat to higher branches to avoid interaction with a predator or another monitor. And so the natural history information on those animals will tell you the differences. Obviously, the morphology of the animal, they are built differently um, than other monitor species. 
So in this example, um, we would say that we have an imported sub-adult female green tree monitor um, that was recently imported. It was set up in an enclosure and it hasn't eaten yet. So we'll say that we've had it for was a common window of time. Let's say it's been here for two weeks and staff haven't seen it eat yet and they haven't found poop. That doesn't mean that it's not eating and it's not pooping, um, but they're not seeing a lot of it uh, to the point where it would be concerning and would lead to an assessment, welfare assessment for this animal. So the animal management, what you're doing right now, so it doesn't matter where the animal came from when it comes to current animal management, you're looking at what you're providing the animal at this point, um, as that's going to be what is uh, directly leading to the welfare of that animal. And um, we see here that the diet's pretty typical. That was our diet for tree monitors at Fort Worth to do uh, usually superworms or crickets. And then we would do some small rodents or baby quail or quail eggs, things like that. But in this case, even though they're providing this diet, they really aren't seeing the animal eating. So this animal has not been seen by a vet, which when you have an imported flighty species like green trees um, outside of the um, prescribing in a parasitic medication, which can still be really harsh on reptiles, um, it's actually fine that you don't have this information on the animal because obtaining even a weight and handling them can be stressful. We usually try to weigh whatever we have in the container we got them in. So we have like a super, super start weight to go off of. But in this case, um, having a delicate import, the less handling is better. And this would be an example of the enclosure that the animal will be put in during either, you know, quarantine period. Let's say, for example, um, it was noted and it's it's kind of common knowledge that a lot of reptile facilities, um, enclosures are kind of built into the spaces that they have. You can't really increase space or change um, exhibit designs in most cases. And a lot of them are at a public viewing height, which does make sense. So this would be an enclosure that would be about the same height as a person. Let's <laughs> just say general person. And so the animal is constantly going to be at or below your level, which does cause a little bit of stress. However, the ability to have a 10 foot enclosure in most cases for a tree monitor is not going to be possible. But there's addition of um, cork bark hides, which tree monitors will use. They like little nooks and crannies to hide in. Um, it has a basking spot. It has the ability to thermoregulate by moving around the enclosure. It has live plants. Um, we'll say the humidity is good. This is an example of where you would be prepared for this animal, but are still running into um, some health and welfare concerns. We'll see the animal is looks like a lean female. So healthy looking as far as we can tell, but extremely skittish. So the outputs, this animal is always hiding and we never see it basking would be um, kind of the situation. This doesn't mean the animal isn't basking when you're not in the room. Um, but if there's a lot of servicing happen happening in an area and the animal would prefer to hide in a colder space than to regulate its temperature, that's something that you wanna keep your eye on. Obviously an imported animal would need time to adjust to a new enclosure um, and just basically everything about its situation. And so this isn't something that um, you can do much about. The animal will typically adjust with time. There are things that you can do to help make them feel more safe when basking, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, rarely seen, and as far as staff know, there's no appetite. So the animal doesn't exhibit a variety, of, a normal variety of behaviors. You're not seeing a lot of basking um, you don't see the animal eating, so those are pretty important behaviors. Doesn't mean they're not happening, but it's very hard to kind of see where you're at if you are not observing some of these normal behaviors. Uh, the animal is not calm and at ease in the enclosure. There is no offering of enrichment or novel items because you don't want to add stressors. And uh, the animal does not have uh, even a neutral... Um, relationship with the animal. The animal does not want to be seen, which is okay. 
And so in this situation, you want to be totally realistic. It's very easy when you do an animal welfare assessment to kind of want, you always want the best for the animal. And that can sometimes kind of cloud what is actually happening. And when you do animal welfare assessments, it's very important not to judge uh, while you're doing it. So we had like an example, for example, our very first assessment was spider monkeys. I know this is not a Varanid example, but it just kind of goes to show when it comes to animal care, there's a lot of emotional investment. And so there are some things about the way that you keep animals sometimes that you can't control that impacts their welfare. And there's things that you can do um, to control how welfare is impacted. And if there is a current keeper practice that is not working for the animal, that does not mean that what has been happening like needs to be blamed on this person. Like, oh, they have terrible uh, mental state because you don't have time to do enrichment. That's It's not blame game. And so these scores are going to be quite a bit different than the pretty much perfect score of the last animal. So when it comes to nutrition, there's going to be different categories in a comprehensive uh, welfare assessment. But overall, if you combine what the animal is being offered, which is good, it's a good diet. Uh, it's a good diet to stimulate feeding, especially using live invertebrates. But the animal is not eating it. Um, you're not seeing foraging behavior. You're not quite sure that it is eating food when you're not there. And so you can't have a very high nutrition score if it's if a good diet's not consumed. And so there's usually a portion under the numbers rating of the animal welfare assessment where you note why. Uh, in our assessments, if it's three or lower, I have keepers note why specifically that category was noted at a lower score so that usually there's something in mind. People usually don't say, oh, probably a one, and then have nothing additional to say about it. The environment, um, the enclosure is good. It's as good as it can be, and animals can adjust to those conditions. Varanids are very adaptable. One thing that may help to encourage basking is covering part or all of the front of the enclosure or adding more foliage around the basking area that actually visually blocks the animal from being able to see you. Um, this way it can still actively bask, but have the ability to not see things that are frightening to it. Um, if this animal was in quarantine, it wouldn't really matter if you covered the front. But outside of that, enclosure is set up for the animal to be able to retreat and climb um, and spend most of its time off the ground. And this is, I mean, you see tree monitors thrive in similar conditions. The health of the animal, um, it hasn't been assessed by a veterinarian and that in itself is risky and it isn't eating. And so that also um, can, is going to affect the animal's health. If they haven't been pooping, then you don't have an opportunity to look for any sort of intestinal parasite or testing a fecal. And so a lot of this is unknown. And so throwing it at a three, keeps your eyes on it, basically. Um, and a lot of it is based on lack of information. And that's just what you're going to run into at some points. So the behavior of the animal is uh, marginal. It's not expressing uh, basic natural behaviors where they can be observed. Doesn't mean they're not happening. Um, but it's a concerning level of retreat from view. Uh, the mental state of the animal, you would assume that this animal would be stressed. Um, it's going to be stressed from importation. It's going to be stressed um, just by everything that's happening. And so this could be a one or a two. And it's not like the uh, keepers or care staff were doing anything that's going to influence those behaviors. This is just being realistic and saying this animal is in a compromised uh, state just through stress. And then as the animal adjusts, you reassess the welfare and you'll see those numbers improve, hopefully. But this is a situation that you see in some monitor species when you're importing individuals. Um, typically, some, some species are so flighty um, that it really does take them quite a while to be comfortable around um, any sort of human interaction, uh, depending on how they're worked with. 
and there are some species that never really have any interest in being present, um, like black roughneck monitors. We had one for quite a while um, at one of the institutions that I worked with. He had no, uh, no interest in even really seeing anybody. Um, we tried to give him space because he never really um, made the decision to interact with us um, even in terms of us like seeing him visually. And that was his choice and that was how it was gonna go. And it's not rare with that species. Um, but if they are not adjusting, then that is the animal that you're going to have. Would not tong feed. It was just super, did, <laughs> did not enjoy uh, what was going on. But it was a beautiful animal. And we gave him extra hiding spots and then he became the invisible monitor. It's important to get eyes on animals as well. I do want to keep that in mind, um, but it's very important when you get an animal that's acclimating, that digging it out every day to see it um, isn't extremely disruptive and kind of setting up viewing so you could at least catch a glimpse of an animal um, is important. So the third example that I would like to go through is going to be one that's common with um, savanna and black and white throat monitors, which is going to be more of a rescue situation or an animal that's come in um, from private ownership. This is a poor, an example of poor private ownership. This is not like what, what I think private ownership looks like, but it's one that I've run into and a couple people that I've talked to since I started this course have run into. So savannas are gonna be different for mother monitors um, in terms of where they spend their time. They're going to be mostly terrestrial species. They uh, spend a lot of time foraging, manipulating substrate, um, either modifying burrows or creating their own burrows that help them thermoregulate. And they are, uh, savannas in particular, since I was a kid, kind of the outline of their diet has changed um, significantly. Like other monitors, they are fed a lot of rodents. And um, I do want to note when it comes to diet that offering rodents instead of all these other kind of exotic prey types is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't think everybody should feed, you know, land snail eating species land snails because it says that in the paper. Um, it's just important to know kind of what you're capable of giving the animal if you have access to it. And sometimes we would do that at Fort Worth with commissary. We knew that um, our African dwarf croc, for example, um, in the wild, they do eat freshwater crabs. And so every couple months, I would be able to snag a crab from the other department's fish order to offer. And I had a uh, paper to send to commissary to approve that type of like diet enrichment. Um, but I think it's important to just have a familiarity with how the animal in the wild feeds and what it eats. And savannas, um, when I was a kid, the only information we had on their diet was a paper done on stomach contents in one specific region of their natural habitat where that population was at that time. I wonder if you can hear the rolling ball. That's the cat. Um, at that time of year, they were eating mostly uh, millipedes. And so it was kind of this big to do about offering invertebrates to savanna monitors and people uh, saying things like, oh, am I supposed to feed it 600 crickets a day? And like that wasn't the point. The point was just to keep in mind what these animals are kind of made for eating, um, like the fat content, the calorie content of what they're being fed. Um, in captivity versus the wild. But uh, with more studies since I was a child, um, we found that their skull morphology and a lot of their feeding habits um, indicates that they eat uh, land snails. A lot of populations eat land snails more, most commonly. And in the US, you cannot get land snails of most species um, if they are non-native because they're agricultural pests. And so do I think savannas should all just eat land snails? No, but <laughs> it's silly now to think or to, to um, kind of preach that all rodent doesn't cause obesity, which it definitely does. So in this example, we have a two for one, which is an obese savanna monitor, which is very common. Um, and then a savanna monitor with previous thermal, thermal 
scarring from a thermal burn. And so you see a lot of savannas that are overweight, and this is usually caused by a combination of poor diet and then poor uh, housing and heating. So in the earlier lesson, we talked about the possibility that um, proper heat has a huge impact on the animal's metabolism and its use of food, and that animals that are usually kept cooler than they are adapted to um, living in are susceptible to a lot of obesity and obesity-related conditions. Another thing that you run into, um, even if you have really good housing, is that it's still pretty common that people who have savannas as pets that aren't reptile, people will feed things like canned cat food. Um, cooked chicken, I mean, mice are good, liver's fine, but usually if an animal will eat something that is inexpensive and easy to access, uh, people will feed just that. And so while canned cat food would be something that you would maybe use for enrichment in small amounts, and the animal would absolutely love it, um, it doesn't mean that they need to be eating cans of it a day. And so in this example, there's a lot of rescues that um, are a part of this class, individuals that rescue, and obese savanna monitors are very common. So the way the animal is managed now, it's gonna be fasted, it's gonna get um, mice, small mice or hoppers um, a couple of times a week, just so it's not empty stomached. Um, and you do wanna get fecal tests and things like that. And it had a physical that day. The results of the physical was obesity. And this animal has a prior history of impaction, which is also often a result of a variety of factors, including heat and humidity uh, and diet. And so the impaction surgery in this example is, um, was completed, is good. The animal is still overweight. So this would be the new enclosure for the animal. It is outdoors, which is a lot different than uh, being the house monitor it was uh, coming in. So I would say for this example in particular, we have access to appropriate heat and sunlight. So not putting them outside in winter <laughs> in a Northern part of the US, for example, but we'll say that this was um, desirable heat and uh, humidity, access to natural sunlight, access to natural substrate, um, live plants, a lot of things the animal wouldn't have interacted with before. And then this is our beautiful animal example. So the output, um, the animal is gonna be pretty active in its new enclosure. So it's gonna be in a new space, oops. It's gonna be in a new space, so it's gonna be kind of stressed out, um, but, we'll say this was a friendly monitor to begin with. And so he's uh, interactive with staff. He's interactive with his environment, he's drinking lots of water, which is good. That may indicate a health condition, but that really depends again on, uh, let's say you didn't get blood tests back from the vet yet. And we'll say, we might not know about kidney function, but you're not a vet. So you would just say, I think it's drinking a lot of water. <laughs> an assessment. So another output, it's starting to show a variety of behaviors. So it starts manipulating substrate. Um, it appears calm and at ease, but easily startled. Obviously, if it hasn't been outdoors before, this will be a change too. Um, you wouldn't be introducing any additional stressors during the animal's acclimation period. And it's generally friendly, but a, a skittish individual. And so looking at this assessing this animal, looking at it right now, it um, <laughs> nutrition, there's no lack of appetite. Um, the diet's going to be more geared towards the weight of the animal. Um, it's going to be watched by staff. So the animal is going to move towards a more um, healthy body weight. But in terms of nutrition, the diet and the appetite are good. So that's going to be a five. The environment is a huge improvement to the previous housing. It has a lot more uh, naturalistic conditions, so it's going to be a five. The animal has everything it needs. The health, we would sit at a, at a three, just due to the weight issue um, and the possibility of um, other medical conditions. The behavior, you'd say, is a four. You're seeing a lot of activity in the animal, um, natural behaviors, things that it um, should be doing. And then mental state, 
the animals in a significantly better setup. However, it is still stressed, so a three or four would be a good place to sit um, as this scoring would change as the animal acclimates to its enclosure. So this would be a, now oh, that was interesting. This will be uh, an animal that is currently in a good situation. It has a fairly um, confident and comfortable demeanor even after the move, and it can really only improve from this point. And it depends too. There are people on my animal welfare team that are incredibly critical on welfare scoring. And then there are other people that are quite a bit less critical and or there will be a critical opinion in a differing area from another staff member. And sometimes you do not see a five unless it's just luxury <laughs> um, and it kind of depends. Um, but when it comes to scoring, especially when you have a lot of animals um, and you want to look at taxa and the species as they are and how their needs are being met, obviously assessing some of these items in varanids is going to be different from um, types of snakes. It'll be very different from types of birds in terms of what you're looking at. But with reptiles, it's a lot of physical indicators. This is an example that I'm going to base off of an animal that I worked with. So water monitors are another commonly kept uh, species of varanid, and you encounter them both in rescues and in collections and as pets. So the inputs, these are animals that are um, active in a variety of different habitats. They can climb as long as something will hold them, and they can be pretty destructive in a smaller enclosure. They're excellent swimmers, as all varanids seem to be, um, but they prefer to forage. They spend uh, their time foraging in and along uh, the shores of water bodies. And they just have kind of a different behavior from both savannas and komodos. In an ideal world, I would have done a lot of very specific examples um, as the types of monitor lizards are so varied um, across this classification. And that was a thing that I ran into when I was creating this course is there is a lot to say not only on them as a group, but also as um, subgenera and individual species. And there was only so much time and so many resources um, for this course. And so it became quite a bit more general than I was anticipating. But for the welfare assessment examples, um, I wanted to choose more commonly kept species and then commonly encountered situations for um, for this classification in general. So this animal, which the enclosure and some of these other things are not going to be, I don't have photos of them, so those are an example. But this animal came to us when I was at the Wildlife Discovery Center in probably like 2000 and, 2010, no, 2010. Yeah, I think she came in 2010. Her name was Kitty. She was an Asian water monitor that we had gotten from a breeder um, she was a very particular animal. She was the first ever water monitor that I worked with. And um, I kind of thought that's how they all were until we got a young one. And then I was like, wow, okay, yeah, this is a really, really special animal. Um, so she was captive, born and bred. She came in at over 18 years of age that we knew of. Her mobility was pretty limited. She had a lot of arthritis. Um, she couldn't really lift her belly when she walked. So she didn't move a whole lot, but if she wanted to go somewhere, she would get there. She also had a lot of scarring along her back that was all fully healed. And that was, according to a previous owner, from a uh, mating interaction. Um, sometimes varanids, especially larger varanids, can inflict really intense wounds on um, individuals of the opposite sex. And they can create sometimes terrible injuries. But um, when we got her, these were fully healed. A lot of what we were dealing with was her um, body condition and her mobility. One other thing about her that caused a lot of issues was she had a really strange, uh, what we thought was um, a neurological issue. It was not something that was ever assessed by a vet um, just because that type of condition 
And the lizard like this, we our veterinarian was not specialized. We got one right after that was excellent. Um, but it would have been really hard to determine the like biological mechanism that caused this. But she would grab food. So you would tongue feed her and she would grab food off of tongues and her jaws just seemed to lock onto the food. So once she had it in her mouth, she would motion like she wanted to swallow it, but she wasn't repositioning it to be swallowed. So she very rarely could grab a food item and swallow it on her own. Um, and this led to a really unique feeding method where when she opened her mouth to receive food, we would put it past her tooth line to her throat so she could swallow it. Um, and this was frustrating for her because she wanted to be able to manipulate her own food. And sometimes we would help her reposition food and she would, um, she always backed up. That was what we thought was also a neurological issue. Whenever she had food in her mouth, she would also back up um, in the really convoluted <laughs> way that she did. And uh, she was with us for, I think, gosh, it was at least two or three more years. She was very old. Um, she just looked old. Her body condition was pretty good when we got her, but over time she became thinner. Uh, in general, she had an excellent demeanor. Um, we had her in a pretty large enclosure that had uh, access to a pool that she could submerge in. And it also had like a second story, a little ramp that went up to a heating area. Um, incredibly messy animals to have not on like a dedicated exhibit, but she did spend a lot of time outside of her enclosure. Um, she had a pretty wide variety of uh, food items. She preferred chicks. So we do pre-killed chicks for her. Um, but as I said, feeding and like feeding related, food related enrichment or incorporated enrichment was really difficult for her to manipulate just because of the way uh, she was, just the way that her condition was. I want to make sure I did not miss anything. Nope. So this would be an example enclosure. So this is a pretty spacious enclosure. It's got access to water feature. Um, it has places to haul out. Uh, the ability to thermoregulate, there's opportunities for climbing. So this would be um, in a situation, if we were assessing welfare, this would be an animal that we would say would be established in this exhibit. So we know she has a history that she's a geriatric animal, which you run into with foranids. Um, my other example of that would have been a very old Komodo that I worked with during the last year and a half of his life, and just they're managed differently. And so we'll say that she's established in this exhibit. She um, has her routines down. She has, we've seen her mobility. We know her pretty well during this assessment. And there she is, beautiful. She was pretty thin towards the end. She was very sweet outside of being frustrated uh, with feeding. She had a pretty good demeanor. We used her for a lot of education. She spent a lot of time outside. She was very passive. Um, pretty curious. So she has limited mobility. She likes to spend time partially submerged, which is not a bad thing. It probably helps with uh, any arthritis. So she's mobile enough to express natural behavior. So she's mobile enough to bask and then move around after basking. She can get to water. Um, one of the issues that we did run into that we had to keep an eye on was that she couldn't, she couldn't go very far um, she would like, she would go to the bathroom and then she would like sleep by where it was. Um, so we tended to have to clean her quite a bit more often if it wasn't in the water because she, her like toilet corner was not very far from where she did everything else. Um, she's clearly old, but has good body condition. And um, when we first got her, she was a bit heavy for her length, um, but not severely. She has a good appetite, but a hard time manipulating food. So she had special feeding assistance. She expresses oops, the normal uh, variety of behaviors that she should, even though it's limited by mobility. She's calm and at ease in the enclosure. She engages with enrichment. She's a very confident animal. Um, she has positive relationships with animal care staff. And so this situation is going to be mostly based on the condition uh, the age and the condition of the animal is going to influence these scores. And again, this is a thing that's out of your control. Um, there's only so 
active and fit an animal can be as it ages. And it's very important that uh, you note or keep in mind that, that the animal, I'm gonna share this example because it was very impactful to me. Um, the very old Komodo that we had at Fort Worth Zoo, um, he was almost 27 when he passed. We ended up euthanizing him. It was a whole process based off of his <laughs> mobility issues, which when I first started working there, we were managing his pain through medication. Um, he had pretty good mobility. He moved a lot for as ancient as he looked and as he was. And there was a certain point where <laughs> he was being heckled by fire ants, basically. So this was in Texas. Um, we had fire ants that got through our shift door. He was not as dexterous as he used to be. And so there was a morning where I came in and there were lots of ants on him. He's just old. So he was awake and he can kind of walk, but his ability to like rid himself of the ants in any way, um, he didn't have the thought to go in the pool. That just wasn't in his capabilities. And so as a result of what we probably thought was quite a few stings from fire ants, um, he had some skin issues after that and he went off a of feed. And the vet team that we had insisted that as we treated him, um, and tried to get him to eat that we also forced him to walk by slinging under his belly um, with like, <laughs> like a pillowcase. So they wanted us to walk him twice a day. I, this was all from fire ants. This is what I, it's just so upsetting. And they wanted it to get to the point where he would be able to high walk again, which he hadn't in like four years. He was not capable of lifting his body off the ground. Um, and they basically were insisting that for his health, he should have the level of mobility that he's passed, biologically past that point, no longer <laughs> capable of walking the way he did when he was half his age. And we were doing this for two or three weeks, but it was hard on the animal. He didn't like it. And uh, we did uh, x-rays on him to see kind of where he was sitting. We had a new vet at the time that came in at the end of this. She did not ask for this. Um, the forced physical therapy. Um, she said, well, uh, his right and left arm are still dislocated at the elbow and his left leg is still dislocated at the knee. And I said, still? And she said, yeah. She said, looking at the x-rays three years ago, this animal has had three dislocated joints from arthritis, where from arthritis, um, and, and it's more severe than it was at that point. So I had not been informed and my supervisor had not been informed by our management that this animal actually physically did not have the bone structure that allowed for it to stand. Um, and because that information wasn't passed along, there were decisions made to kind of encourage mobility that were in fact incredibly harmful to the animal. Um, and that was really hard to deal with. And um, he should have been left alone. Uh, he shouldn't, I just don't, I don't understand anything about that decision. But there was another series of treatments that we decided to get as an institution that looking back on, I can't condone, which is we did do acupuncture um, on our Komodo, which the acupuncture itself wasn't the problem. He really had no reaction to it. Um, he didn't react when they went in. He didn't react when they came out. We didn't see any improvement. I mean, if there was the possibility of improvement, this animal was not capable of it being significant to the point of noticeable. There was just really nothing you could do at this point that was going to make it any more improved. But we did do the electro acupuncture and the animal did not like it. Um, that was the, one of the only times that I worked with him that I saw him get up, try to get up and get away. And they were like, oh, well, he just needs it for a couple minutes. And it's like, he hasn't gotten up for your needles and he's getting up for your electroshocking and he's not happy with it. And we did that twice and it didn't really do very much. And 
when it comes to treatments like that, especially with acupuncture, you don't have the, the, I can see people going to get it because they have an understanding of what to expect. But when you do acupuncture on an old animal for its benefit, the stress of the process, I feel like makes it very difficult to see any benefit. I guess the point is, <laughs> the point is, that when they're old, just let them be old. You wanna keep them mobile so they don't get sore, but you don't wanna force their mobility. And having an idea of how intense arthritis is um, or other age-related conditions are, it's very important to know where you're starting so that you're not making decisions that are in fact like extremely counter to what the animal should have forced onto it. And so he didn't know any better. The Komodo had a great life. He got everything that he wanted <laughs> except for the ants. Um, and he came back from that. We had him for another year. And then uh, he got to the point where like walking and moving enough to thermoregulate it all or even get to water was just, that was not happening. And that was when we made a quality of life decision. So having an old animal in this situation, its health is gonna be a three because you want to say five because you want to say, wow, they're in great health for their age, but in overall health, um, they're at a point where that's going to start um, uh, decreasing. Quality of life is going to decrease just with the inability for them to do what they need to do to thermoregulate and to get access to resources. The behavior, um, she had limited mobility, so but she did what she had to. Um, this was a relatively low score because of her inability to feed herself. She got enough food and we would never overstress her during feedings, but it was very strange for us to just, I don't know how she was fed before we got her. He never said anything about the jaw injury. And that's one of those mysteries you get from getting an animal from somewhere else. Um, but the behavior is not all there. The ability to express natural behavior, um, food handling and eating is pretty important and basic. And the mental state of the animal, I would say from day to day, um, was at about a four. Um, I'm sure that there's things that she wanted to do that were challenging. Um, and during feeding, I would say that stress impacted her mental state, um, but it was never really to the point where it was like, oh, we shouldn't feed her. <laughs> it was a really weird call to make. And we had her for, I think, two and a half years. She passed away naturally. Um, I do not believe that we got a necropsy. So I don't have any results on that. But this would be another situation. A lot of times, institutions that have large Komodo species, um, really any Komodo species, but the large terrestrial ones are where you see a lot of the mobility issues um, just because of the wear on their joints and things like that. And I wanted to give examples in uh, with varying focuses and subjects and kind of welfare issues that you would run into. So if you had an animal like this and you were having a meeting in regard to um, changes you could make to improve the animal's welfare, um, making sure the animal is in an enclosure where they can access all the resources. So this is a fairly large enclosure. Um, at a certain point, that animal is not really going to be mobile enough to, to use a lot of that space. Um, sometimes you retire animals to off exhibit space that seems significantly smaller because it is, um, but you can't, you don't want to put the animal in a situation where you're forcing it to travel long distances for resources if it's in human care and it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to go through that. Um, <laughs> it shouldn't have to do that if you don't have to do that. Uh, but that wraps up this. This was one of uh, my favorite activities or live classes. There's a lot about live classes that I need to reassess for the next lesson uh, or for the next version of this course. I would like to add some additional content to this to have it reoffered and then offer those expansions to people that did to pay for this course. Um, that information that's probably going to be next spring before I would redo any of this. But I wanted to also record this lesson. Um, I haven't been recording live classes because the majority of them were summation of lessons. And um, thinking for next time, it will be 
more materials like this, more specific examples, having guest speakers, that type of thing. But I want to thank you so much for coming. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time taking the course. Um, I, at completion of the course, I appreciate any feedback that could be given. Um, and if there's anything additional that you need from me or anything that you need help with or would like to talk to somebody about, if there's a specific species or situation, I can usually find someone who knows if I don't know and I don't know everything, that's for sure. But thank you so much. This is one of the shortest things I've ever done. Um, this will be edited and uploaded, but thank you very much. Have a good night.